Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Our province's finance critic, Shanna Phillips, explains why she says Alberta's economy will be lagging behind other provinces. There was another fire set to a Catholic church on a First Nation. This one is located just outside of Calgary. And the search for more survivors continues in South Florida following the devastating collapse of a condo building. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Robbins. Thanks so much for joining us. Neighbours don't always get along and feuds can sometimes get out of hand. That's what happened for a couple in Pincher Creek, Alberta. BCN's Naveen Day spoke with a resident who says his neighbour poured chemicals into his rain collection barrel that caused his child and dog to get sick. Dylan Fulliard of Pincher Creek says he would often receive complaints from his neighbours over small issues. We're coming home too late, the Christmas lights are too bright, the, spring, the sprinklers, you know, the wind's blowing some water into their yard and they don't like that. Fulliard installed cameras around his property after becoming suspicious that his neighbours may be causing mischief. On June 3rd, after returning home from a bicycle ride, the recorded footage showed him something alarming. I kind of saw her near the fence with something in her head, and I kind of thought maybe she was sabotaging my motorcycle or something. So I dug a little deeper, and then that's when I, I saw that she'd been tampering with the rain barrel. I rushed home immediately, and, you know, I kind of looked around the rain barrel, and it was it was frothing and foaming and had a real funny scent to it. And that's kind of when, when I realized that they'd been tampering with the water barrel. Fulliard contacted the RCMP to report the incident. He and his girlfriend are waiting on results from tests to determine what was placed in the water. This is weeks after a toddler who used the water for swimming developed rashes and their dog became very ill. Blood work suggests the dog's immune system is attacking her pancreas from ingestion of toxic chemicals. Their entire garden, flower beds and two trees also died. According to Fulliard, the neighbors admitted to police to pouring the herbicide Roundup into the rain collection barrel after hearing about the existence of surveillance footage. They were charged with mischief. In a Facebook post, Fulliard says he is disappointed that the couple was not charged more severely. He adds that he does not feel safe on his own property. We've now got to do lots of supervised bathroom breaks with the dog. You know, we have to sweep the lawn, make sure there's no needles or fish hooks or dog bones or something that shouldn't be there. You know, it's no longer really play in our backyard. It's, it's eerie. You're always checking the cameras or you hear a you hear the wind blow and and you don't know if you got to go and double check if the doors are locked in the middle of the night bridge city news reached out to the couple who were allegedly charged in the incident a woman at the residence declined to comment and said that fulliard has no business talking with the media for bridge city news i'm naveen day even though school is out for summer, local law enforcement agencies have joined forces to bring forth an initiative designed to help children start off the next school year right. Organizers say the program this fall will help provide students with a new pair of shoes so they can start the new school year on the right foot. Today we are collaborating not only as a community but also with our surrounding Indigenous communities, law enforcement with Begani Nation, RCMP, as well as Blood Tribe Police Service and Lethbridge Police Service. We are here today to ask our community to come together to sponsor over 200 children is our optimistic goal. We do anticipate more so we can come together and ensure as many children within our community of Lethbridge, four schools particularly, represented from both school districts, along with children and students in the Begani and Kainai Nation. We want to bring our community collectively together to ensure that all students that are in need can return back to the school year with brand new shoes. Lethbridge Police Service will be leading a hand to the shoe drop-off event on August 14 to show our ongoing support for these community initiatives to make this uh, our community and also in this case our neighboring communities a better place to live and make sure we look after our kids. Any student of any age may be selected for a new pair and the shoes will be available for pickup at Lethbridge College. As Alberta enters stage three of the economic relaunch, with all restrictions being lifted, not everyone is happy with the decisions made by the government. NDP finance critic and Lethbridge West MLA Shannon Phillips says the Kenny government has mismanaged the pandemic. Phillips says the choices regarding the economy will have made Alberta lagging behind other provinces for quite some time. 
What we have seen in Alberta is that we ha have experienced such uh, a, a very poor economic growth since even before the pandemic. And so relative to the rest of the country, and in particular the big economies, right, Quebec, Ontario, British Columbia, uh, and Saskatchewan, which is also a, a, an oil and gas economy, we're starting from far further back. Uh, and so, you know, while we might see a, a, a bit more growth this year, the fact is, is that our starting position is, is so much weaker than the rest of, uh, than the, rest of the, the large provinces and the rest of the country, effectively. I think what's important for Albertans to understand about that is that there hasn't been a job strategy from the UCP. And that is, uh, you know, that lack of focus on ordinary people and working people is actually what's driving some of the lag in our recovery. Phillips adds that according to Stats Canada, Alberta had the slowest performing economy with a contraction of 8.2%. Our province is reporting its lowest COVID-19 case count in nearly a year. Alberta reported just 31 new cases of the virus on Monday out of 4,500 tests. There are currently 179 people in hospital with the virus, including 39 in the ICU. There were also two additional deaths related to the COVID-19 virus yesterday. Across the province, there are just 1,261 active cases of the virus, along with 42 here in the South Zone. There are just five here in Lethbridge. Tabor Town Council voted to fall in line with provincial guidelines. The bylaw, which has been in place since last November, was repealed on Monday and will take effect on July the 1st. The numbers have been going in the right direction and prove it all the way across the province. So again, we're just kind of following the Alberta Health Services uh, guidelines and recommendations. And we, we always have uh, followed their, their guidelines and recommendations right from the start. So this is no different and uh, we're just following through with what we believed was appropriate at this particular stage in the uh, deal with the uh, uh, ending of the, the pandemic, hopefully the ending forever. Canada Today is just around the corner. It's a time to reflect and as many would say, celebrate our country's 154th birthday. For our poll question this week, we are asking if you are disappointed that the City of Lethbridge is not doing anything special for Canada Day, including our fireworks. Make sure you log on to our website, bridgecitynews.ca, and let us know your thoughts. We will add up the votes and have them for you on Wednesday's newscast. With Lethbridge located in the heart of southern Alberta, agriculture plays a major role in our economy. The University of Lethbridge has introduced the Agri-Food Summer Series where local producers and researchers will discuss different agricultural topics related to the industry. UofL Research Associate Dr. Kim Stanford will be the first speaker of the series and she'll be discussing what exactly cattle eat. How much of that is not food that, that humans can or would want to would want to be using. I've been working for quite a few years now on cereal ergot, which is a, a fungus that gets into all grain crops, uh, mostly rye, wheat, uh, gets, gets into barley too. And it makes uh, the ergot itself is toxic to humans and, and to livestock as well. So when grain is cleaned for use by people, then all of the contaminated stuff gets shuffled down the line to, to, towards livestock. The remaining four sessions will take place over the next few months. If you'd like to join in, you can visit the University of Lethbridge's website. The village of Sterling received additional funding for their Cenotaph project. Now, the initiative is meant to honor veterans from Sterling. As Micah Quinn explains now, the Cenotaph will feature the names of veterans carved inside to forever be immortalized. Glenn Miller from the Lethbridge Legion presented a check today to the Mayor of Sterling, Trevor Lewington, totaling $15,000 to help pay for the Cenotaph project. Well, at the Legion level, it helps us in promoting remembrance. Uh, so again, whether you're a large community or small, the impact was the same for all those communities that participated. And so this is a visible and permanent way of um, letting the next generation know the commitment made uh, both here at home and abroad of their veterans. The funds came from the Lethbridge Legion Poppy Fund, which seeks donations year-round from the public. And all those donations are, are put into a trust fund run by the Poppy Fund to help vet families and veterans um, in need. And they have a very specific uh, set of rules of how that fund uh, can be used. The total cost to build the Cenotaph is $52,000, and Mayor Lewington says the village is grateful to the Legion for their contribution to the project. Yeah, so what we've contemplated is, for example, some benches that match the same rock type as the, the actual monument itself, potentially some flowers around the outside. 
uh, accent lighting, security cameras, things like that that we would have otherwise had to cover. This will help us, again, make it uh, more of a centerpiece for the whole community. A total of 104 names of those who served from Sterling during World War I and II will be added to the Cenotaph. You can view the full list of names on the Village of Sterling's website. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Canada Day will be a great opportunity to get on a road trip to see what Southern Alberta has to offer. But if you're looking for a more traditional small community feel to celebrate our country's birthday, the hamlet of Granham may have you covered. Basically have an even, evening set of events, which will consist of a community parade and we'll have cars, uh, you know, show and shine type cars from around the area, plus local floats and local businesses and towns in the parade. And that starts at seven. Um, and the resources that we would normally have put into the other events during the day, we decided to have an extra special bang at uh, fireworks. Um, so we have about 20 minutes worth of fireworks and it's really the only one and typically the only one in our area. The fireworks will be launched at Grandview Park. Kennedy suggests arriving between 9 and 10 p.m. to get a good viewing spot. RCMP say the fire that damaged a Catholic church on the Siksika First Nation east of Calgary on Monday was deliberately set. Fortunately, no one was injured and fire officials were able to put out the flames before there was any more damage. Police in BC, meanwhile, are also investigating four recent fires that destroyed Catholic churches in the southern interior and churches in Edmonton and Saskatoon that were vandalized with red paint last week. Hundreds of what are believed to be unmarked graves have been recently discovered at two former residential schools that were operated by a Catholic religious order. A pilot who is battling a wildfire west of Edmonton has been killed. Fire officials say the pilot crashed his helicopter late Monday evening. His body has since been recovered from the wreckage. RCMP declined to provide any more details other than the pilot was a contractor involved in fighting a wildfire burning near the community of Evansburg. The pilot was the sole person on the aircraft when it went down. The wildfire burning near Evansburg was detected on June 22nd and has since grown to 175 hectares. With the extreme heat the West Coast has been experiencing, the BC Wildfire Service has banned campfires across the province beginning at 12 noon June 30th. The ban will remain in effect until October 15th, as will the ban on larger open fires announced last week. Last week's open fire bans also prohibit the use of fireworks, sky lanterns, tiki torches and burn barrels. The Association of Manitoba Museums is wondering when its members will be allowed to reopen. Unlike restaurants and hair salons, museums in the province must remain closed under COVID-19 public health orders. The association's executive director, Monique Brandt, says museums are being hurt financially and this time of year is normally their busy season. Health officials say prolonged indoor gatherings are high risk and the province is still working to reduce the transmission of the virus. Saskatoon City Council voted unanimously to change the name of John A. Macdonald Road in the neighbourhood of Confederation Park. Mayor Charlie Clark says it is a generational moment for the city. Canada's first Prime Minister was one of the architects of residential schools. Sir John A. Macdonald was also criticized by Indigenous people for furthering colonization. Mayor Clark says it is important that First Nations, Métis and Inuit in Saskatoon know the city is committed to reconciliation. Former humble Bronco Ryan Strachnitsky, who was paralyzed from the chest down in the fatal bus crash three years ago, hit another milestone in his rehab. With the help of a walker, he was able to stand for the first time in a very long time. How did it feel the first time you were able to stand? <laughs> yeah, it's, it was incredible. I mean, doing that on my own, it was both physically and mentally exhausting, but you know, I'm happy I did it, and it's a, it's a good step in the right direction. Without their help, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing, so yeah, I'm just trying to be more independent. Pretty happy, mix of emotions, but again, not really satisfied. I, I know I got a lot more to, more to give, and I know next session's gonna be even harder, so it, it's you know, really humbling to see the, uh, the progress that I've made, but I've got a long way to go. Federal Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole says his party is ready to face future pandemics by implementing an emergency preparedness plan. He says the initiative will include partnering with pharmaceutical companies. Canada's Conservatives will ensure that Canada is ready to face future pandemics. Our goal is simple. Ensure Canada is prepared and take rapid action so that we protect the health of Canadians while avoiding long-term impacts on the economy and on the mental health of Canadians. Canada's Conservatives will implement a Canada Emergency Preparedness Plan. The plan will be measured and updated regularly and ensure we are never unprepared for a pandemic again. 
The mayor of Miami-Dade says another body was recovered overnight from the site of a collapsed condo building, bringing the confirmed death toll to 10. Daniela levine Cava says, however, that 151 people still remain unaccounted for. We did recover another body. That brings the count to 10. The total number of those accounted for is now 135, and the total unaccounted, 151. Families, because of the process we've gone through, are coming to their own conclusions. Some are feeling uh, more hopeful, some less hopeful, because we do not have definitive answers. We give them the facts. We take them to the site. We show them the operation. We show them where the pancake is. We show them where the tunnel is. We show them where the dogs are, are running up and uh, identifying something that is, that is then going to be explored. They have seen the operation. They understand now how it works and they are preparing themselves for news one way or the other. Rescue crews with the Miami-Dade County Fire Department continue to search for survivors in that rubble. The search now in its sixth day continues with pleas from family members with missing loved ones. It's an incredibly dangerous uh, site. We've got a lot of rescuers working. We've got a lot of equipment, and including heavy equipment, moving about. And, you know, part of our challenge now is trying to control that rescue operation. We're doing everything we can to try to unearth any voids that could contain a survivor. And uh, we're going to continue on rescue operations until there's such time as we determine the likelihood of survival is almost nothing. You have to maintain hope. Every rescuer out here has that hope. Well, I just want the family members, everybody watching, to realize that every rescuer here is maintaining hope. They're putting themselves in harm's way, to try to recover any victims that they can, and we're gonna continue to do that. U.S. President Joe Biden is assuring Israel that he would not tolerate a nuclear Iran as he met with outgoing Israeli President Reuven Rivlin. Biden told Rivlin that his commitment to Israel's security is ironclad. This includes, uh, um, we're, you know, we're committed to unwavering commitment to your self-defense. And uh, today we're going to be discussing a broad range of challenges, including Iran, what I can say to you, Iran will never get a nuclear weapon on my watch, as they say. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, uh, I, I directed last night's airstrikes targeting uh, um, sites used by the Iranian-backed militia group responsible for recent attacks on U.S. personnel in Iraq. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, says when it comes to the United States rejoining the Iran nuclear talks, Israel it's not that happy about it. Israel is not too keen on uh, the U.S. normalizing time, ties with the Iranian regime, pouring more money uh, into the system, allowing them to get off the hook, allowing the sanctions to be removed from intricate and very focused and targeted sectors uh, like weapons, like cyber, like uh, you know all the other um, arenas which allow them to grow and prosper their uh, terrorist machine. Lisa will also discuss how protests and riots in Lebanon right now are the worst in over 150 years. She'll have more details for us later in the show. Well, heat warning continued for much of southwestern Alberta today as we got well over 30 degrees once again. How long will the hot spell continue? Full weather details are coming up. This is really the time of year when you need to stay as hydrated as possible and out of the sun during the really hot peak times. Jeanette Rocher is back with a full look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, we think it's hot here. In BC and the Okanagan, they're seeing temperatures almost 10 degrees hotter than we're receiving here in southern Alberta. Yeah, and it's the duration of that BC heat wave that is so concerning as much of their overnight temperatures are also uh, staying close to 25 degrees. So there's very little reprieve from the heat. And of course, during the daytime, they're looking at temperatures up to about 48 degrees. So hopefully our friends in BC are doing their best to stay cool during this heat wave. And speaking of which, of course, we have our own Alberta heat wave here that is affecting us in Lethbridge, much of southern Alberta, and also the rest of Alberta up to Edmonton and Calgary as 
well. So look at these temperatures tomorrow. We're looking at record breaking temperatures all week here. Uh, 37 degrees the high for Wednesday under sunny sky sunshine and 37 on Thursday uh, 35 on Friday 32 on Saturday and then we're going to cool it down a bit just to 31 degrees for Sunday and Monday. You know, it's something else when you can say that we're cooling off to 31 degrees, but that's kind of how it is. Well above the average temperature, or the average high for this time of year, which is 24. Average low, 10 degrees. 34 was our high temperature on this day back in 1984. So we are looking at actually breaking a record today as well. Four degrees was our coolest temperature on this day back in 1987. Sun rose this morning at 5, 27 a.m. and sunset this evening, 9, 43 p.m. So we're still sitting in the longest days of the year here as we are in the end of June approaching the beginning of July. Victoria 28 degrees tomorrow the high and uh, with lots of sunny skies there Vancouver 27 and finally getting out of those 30s getting down into the 20s for them. Uh, 37 the high tomorrow in Edmonton Calgary's high at 35 with lots of sunshine actually they should be expecting a 40 kilometer wind uh, tomorrow. 34 the high in Saskatoon as the rest of the prairie is also looking at very hot conditions. Uh, sunshine in 31 in Regina and 30 degrees is the high expected tomorrow in Winnipeg under sunny skies. So everyone just needs to stay cool. Now our friends over here in central Canada are looking at possibility of showers with risk of thunderstorms tomorrow. High of 29 in Toronto, 28 in Ottawa and Montreal sitting at 26 degrees tomorrow uh, with that chance of rain and thunderstorms there as well. Same thing for Fredericton looking at that risk of a thunderstorm tomorrow rain as well 30 degrees the high in Fredericton 28 in Halifax looking at showers in the afternoon afternoon showers also in Charlottetown expected tomorrow 27 the high and 21 in St. John's Newfoundland also looking at some showers there as well so there you have it that is your forecast today's weather is brought to you by Jeff Reimer of Royal LePage South Country Real Estates 403-380-1779 a U.S. federal judge has dealt a blow to attempts by regulators to rein in tech giants. The judge dismissed antitrust lawsuits brought against Facebook by the Federal Trade Commission and a coalition of state attorneys general. The suits were deemed legally insufficient and without enough evidence to prove that Facebook was a monopoly. The ruling dismisses the complaint, but not the case, meaning that the FTC could refile another complaint. The FTC alleged Facebook engaged in a systemic strategy to eliminate its competition, including by purchasing up-and-coming rivals like Instagram and WhatsApp. The U.S. Railway Regulator says it has received hundreds of submissions about CN Rail's proposed takeover of Kansas City Southern. Montreal-based CN Rail says it is confident that its transaction will receive all approvals and that it will ultimately combine with the American Railway. But rival CP Rail says more than a thousand shippers have written to the regulator in support of its proposed combination with KCS or in opposition to the CN proposal. It says it also plans to file comments showing the public interest costs of CN's voting trust outweigh what it describes as the non-existent benefits. Electronic cigarette giant Jewel Labs will pay around $40 million to North Carolina to take more action to prevent underage use and sales. That is according to a landmark legal settlement announced after years of accusations that the company had fueled an explosion in teen vaping. Jewel promises not to advertise to anyone under the age of 21 in North Carolina and says it will put restrictions in place for sales both online and at brick and mortar retailers. Disney Cruise Line is postponing its first test cruise since the pandemic brought the industry to a standstill. The Disney Dream is scheduled to set sail from Florida on Wednesday with 300 employees who had volunteered for the simulation cruise. The trip was postponed indefinitely, however, because of a small number of employees who had inconsistent results in COVID-19 testing. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 25 points on the day to finish at 20,171. The Dow was up 9 points to 34,292. The S&P 500 was up 1 point to 4,292. And the Nasdaq was up 27 points on the day to 14,528. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 7 cents to 72.98 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 4 cents to 363 US. Gold was up 29 cents to 1761.53 US an ounce, and silver was even at 25.77 US an ounce. Wheat is at $350 per metric ton. Barley's also at 350. Canola's at 790, 
and corn is at $405 per metric ton. Live cattle were up 45 cents to 122.55. Feeder cattle were up $1.05 to 157.40. And lean hogs were up 203 to 106.98. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to 80.65 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, our province is reporting its lowest COVID-19 case count in nearly a year. Alberta reported just 31 new cases of the virus on Monday out of 4,500 tests. There are currently 179 people in hospital with the virus, including 39 in the ICU. There were also two additional deaths related to COVID-19 yesterday. Across the province, there are 1,261 active cases of the virus, along with 42 here in the south zone. There are just five located here in Lethbridge. More than 150 people are still unaccounted for following the collapse of a condo building in South Florida. Questions remain as to what caused the collapse. U.S. journalist Lisa Daftari will have answers for some of those questions in just a moment. There are still more than 150 people unaccounted for, including four Canadians, following that devastating condo building collapse in Miami-Dade County. To discuss this in more detail is U.S. political reporter Lisa Daftari. Lisa, the death toll keeps climbing. Do we know for certain what caused the Surfside building to collapse? It seems like there was a problem with the foundation. Uh, some reports indicate that the building had some faulty uh, foundation problems for over a decade um, that weren't properly addressed. Um, you know, this sounds crazy at this time in, you know, uh, the, the, when there's so many inspections and there's so many codes and, and people really keep keeping up with it. This was a condo building. So obviously having a management board and such, but it doesn't take away from the very, very sad reality this happened happened at one in the morning. Uh, obviously, a lot of people home sleeping. Uh, and therefore, that's, you know, so many people are, are, are unaccounted for uh, till this moment. So we're, we're hoping for the best. Really, prayers are all around for the families of those who have um, people missing. Absolutely. Now, search and rescue teams from Israel and Mexico have joined local experts combing through the rubble looking for survivors. Why was the extra help brought in? Yeah, this is interesting. I think that the rate at which they were trying to get through the rubble, um, if you've seen the footage, Hal, it's, it's tremendous. It's just piled up. And with such a high number of people missing, they're thinking if they expedite, perhaps, perhaps, by miracle of God, they can, they can find some people um, who may still be alive uh, under this mess, both Israel and Mexico having um, experience with this. Israel, obviously, this is a Jewish community, and they, they feel you know ties to this community. Community, but Israel is always sending uh, help around the world, regardless of, of whether it is a Jewish community or not. They have a ton of experience with this type of work. And Mexico in particular um, recently had an earthquake, recently had to dig up um, a lot of rubble and to get you know survivors out. So um, you know, we're very grateful for the additional help and hope that these um, you know, multiple rescue crews can pull out some of the uh, hopefully survivors. Now, speaking of Israel, their new government has voiced strong opposition to the United States potentially rejoining the Iran nuclear talks. Israel's foreign minister and the U.S. Secretary of State recently met in Rome to discuss. Yeah, you'd think this would be a no-brainer, something that doesn't need to be said with Israel, reminding the uh, heads of state here in the United States that they're against an Iran nuclear deal, against normalizing ties with a terrorist regime that pours money into more terrorism in the region. And Israel being a short distance away from the Iranian regime's uh, reach, uh, you know, again, reminder that the Iranian regime calls Israel the little Satan and the United States the big Satan. So, uh, you know, all guns are pointed towards uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and everywhere else. We just had a recent conflict w between Hamas and Israel. And, you know, who funds Hamas? Of course, the Iranian regime. So, you know, that, uh, you know, Israel is not too keen on uh, the U.S. normalizing time ties with the Iranian regime, pouring more money uh, into the system, allowing them to get off the hook, allowing the sanctions to be removed from intricate and very focused and targeted sectors. Uh, like weapons, like cyber, like, uh, you know, all the other um, arenas which allow them to grow and prosper their uh, terrorist machine. I mean, obviously, Israel has voiced concern before, but now that we're down to the wire, uh, Israel feels like they have to give the U.S. another reminder. 
Iran says it will not extend the agreement it signed with the International Atomic Energy Agency in February to monitor its nuclear program. There's a big surprise. Now, it was set to expire on May 24th. Lisa then extended until June 24th, which has also passed. The agreement enabled the agency to collect data on Iran's nuclear activities. Yeah, well, as you said, no surprise, Hal. But, you know, um, the Iranian regime wasn't being transparent anyway. They weren't allowing these inspectors into the more sensitive places, places that would indicate that they are, in fact, continuing with their nuclear program, that they are, in fact, continuing with enrichment of uranium. Uh, and it would be problematic, obviously, to the international community, to the UN's IAEA, and, of course, to the to the nuclear deal. Um, but, you know, now the Iran feels that they have the upper hand. Look, when they have the international community spearheaded by the a new administration in Washington, D.C., telling them that they want to sit down and uh, sign another nuclear deal similar to the one that we had in 2015, well, they feel that they're in a position of power. They feel like they're in the position of having the leverage here. And I'll remind you, Iran has a new president now, President Raisi, who is a, a, a self-proclaimed hardliner. He is a butcher by all means, uh, has a ton of experience in the regime and a ton of blood on his hands. So uh, he's going to have a different approach and he's going to have a more hardlined approach and he's going to flex muscles. That's exactly what they're doing. They're saying, we're not going to comply. Uh, not only are we breaching what we uh, agreed to in the 2015 agreement, but we are going to do more, not allow you to get in uh, for inspections. And we're going to demand that all sanctions be removed before we even sit down to the table again. They also refuse to meet with uh, President Biden in advance of, of signing a deal. So they feel like they definitely have the upper hand here. We'll see what it's going to take to get a, a nuclear deal. And again, many, many people here in the United States are warning against an Iran a nuclear deal. And of course, Israel has its reservations as well. Labor strikes over economic demands hit Iran's vital petrochemical and oil industries recently, Lisa. Now, that prompted some experts to say that the demise of the regime could start with some of this labor unrest. Yeah, well, there, there's been uh, labor unrest before. Um, I'll remind you that there have been so many protests in recent years, always starting with some sort of industry, some sort of impetus. Um, and that catalyst usually uh, is some sort of economic grievances, some sort of, of restrictions, some sort of tariff. Uh, and that becomes an excuse to start protests that are not only in demand of those restrictions being removed, but really removing the entire regime as a whole. That's what we're seeing in, in Iran these days. We just had an election where 60 to 70 percent of eligible voters boycott the election. Um, they abstained from voting. They said, we don't believe in this system. We don't believe in this government. It was a selection and not an election, meaning all the candidates were of the same fabric and others were not allowed to run as candidates. So therefore, we will not partake. And now these protests are sending another signal to the government in Iran saying, look, we are fed up. We are disenchanted with our government as a whole. And we want to tell the world about our disenchantment. The only problem with this, Hal, is we've seen it in previous years. We saw it in 2009 with the Green Revolution. And we've seen smaller episodes since, including in 2019, where there were over 1,500 protesters killed. Wow. It will get bloody and ugly before it's over, but the government will make sure that it's over before we see any kind of significant change. Lisa, Israel's ambassador to the United States, resigned last weekend, hours after welcoming Israeli President Rivlin to D.C. Explain why Gilad Erdan stepping aside is such a big deal. It's a big deal. It really disrupts the wonderful relationship between uh, Israel and the United States. It also signals, um, you know, a lot of disenchantment with, with uh, of Israel uh, against the United States and our, their relationship that has been put on the back burner, um, you know, in, in preference to uh, their relationship with the Iranian regime. Look, Israel, again, has voiced its concern uh, about, you know, cozying up to the Iranian regime, and yet we're we're seeing from the administration, you know, no adherence to uh, Israel's, um, you know, claim to the Golan Heights. We just saw that last week. We don't even see them mentioning the term Abraham Accord. They just dismiss it as some sort of, you know, accord that was signed under the Trump administration. And whether it's for 
it's whether it's for making an about face or, you know, 180 on the, the Trump era uh, and his close relationship with Bibi Netanyahu and Israel, or whether it's in ideology and really turning on Israel um, for, you know, in, in, in exchange for, you know, cozying up further to the Iranian regime, making a deal, really siding with Israel's enemies instead of with Israel. It's a mistake, you know? Um, we look back to a time where support for Israel was bipartisan. It wasn't a left or right issue. It wasn't a liberal or conservative issue. It was the right position to take for the, for the United States as the only democratic state in the region and our major ally. We rely on them just like they rely on us here in the United States. So um, it's a mistake and uh, a lot of people are warning against it. And this resignation is yet another indication of a splintering relationship between Jerusalem and Washington. Okay, Lisa, let's talk about the major rioting which is taking place in Lebanon. Lebanese troops deployed to the northern city of Tripoli recently, taking positions around major state institutions following protests and riots against worsening living conditions. Many protesters and at least 10 police officers were injured. In fact, the World Bank is describing the crisis as one of the worst the world has witnessed in 150 years. Yeah, Hal, this is a story that not many people are paying attention to. And yet, you know, Lebanon has been in a downward spiral for quite some time now. Uh, since last August, they have not had a stable government. Their economy has been tanking. They are in a, a horrible, horrible uh, in, inflation period with uh, basic goods being unavailable to them. And on the cherry on top being Hezbollah, uh, the terror organization funded by the Iranian regime, taking over so many parts parts of that country, with people on the street saying, look, we've had enough, we've reached rock bottom. Uh, and it's always, always the economic factor that pushes people out onto the streets, regardless of how much instability there can be with regards to politics and terrorism and other things, it'll always be getting bread on the table that will push people out onto the streets. And that's exactly what we're seeing in Lebanon, a place worth uh, really focusing on and uh, trying to create stability there. They're one of the states that have the potential to join the modern states in the Arab world in coming closer to the United States, coming closer to Israel, uh, like the states that signed on to the Abraham Accords, for example. Uh, Lebanon definitely has that, that potential, and the people on the streets are saying that. We want a better future of prosperity, and we're tired of the status quo. Lisa, with China emerging as a major threat to many other countries around the world, India is looking to expand its military capabilities in space. The director of the Center for Security, Strategy and Technology says geopolitics is the primary driver for India to focus on the military aspects of its space program. Finally, some good news out of India, right, Hal? We've been waiting for this for a while now with uh, all that bad news and all those bad numbers, uh, COVID numbers rising steadily over there. Finally, we see India coming out on top, com being competitive with its neighbor, China, looking over to China and seeing how they are growing all their capabilities, whether it be uh, militarily in space, uh, cyber capabilities, and they're saying we want to compete as well. So uh, some good news out of India, all good, some good competition, but I think the rest of the world needs to uh, look at the reality too. China's growing and they're growing steadily and the uh, Western world needs to take a look at that and really reevaluate uh, the threat that China is. There was some major outrage in Pakistan recently when the country's Prime Minister Imran Khan blamed the rape crisis on women. In fact, he told a reporter who said there was a rape epidemic in Pakistan that, quote, if a woman is wearing few clothes, it will have an impact on the man unless they're a robot. It's common sense. Uh, last time I checked, that is not common sense. No, I mean, I, this is, it's awful. What he said is just horrific. Um, even alluding to that is just horrific. Uh, and for a person in a position of, of prime minister to say that uh, and to really dismiss the threat of rape, uh, the, the threat of, or, or taking away the responsibility of men in that equation is just, it's just horrific. Uh, I was about to post that as before we came on live. Uh, and I, I just wanted to, you know, um, 
make a mention uh, that you know this is this is the world that we live in. So you have you know people um, all over the world criticizing you know countries like Canada, like the United States. In fact, there's an Olympic uh, athlete who wants to go to the uh, Olympics and win so that that she can burn a U.S. flag on stage. And then you juxtapose that with episodes like this where you know women aren't even acknowledged when they're being raped. They're actually blamed for the clothing that they're wearing. You know, um, it makes us a grateful for where we live and be uh, realistic about the rest of the world and um, what the realities there are for women. Lack of opportunity and really lack of justice in this case. So uh, just shaking my head at this one. Yeah, no kidding. Thank God we've come a long way as a society here in North America. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles. Thanks so much, Lisa. My pleasure. Loneliness is often an issue in our society, but with the COVID pandemic, it appears to be on the increase. What's the best way to deal with this? Joining me to discuss this further is Ralph Molyneux. He is the site pastor at Victory Church in Lethbridge. Welcome to Bridge City News, Pastor Ralph. It's so great to have you on today. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Pastor Ralph, a recent IPSIS poll revealed that 54% of Canadians say that they're feeling lonely and isolated. So, is this consistent with what you're observing in people here in southern Alberta, with maybe with your, your pastoring and your counseling? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think some, depending on personality types, are dealing with it better. And some people, they're still doing all the work that they normally did, but others who were forced to isolate and maybe hadn't you know, cut back on their connections, I can see that being extremely difficult for them. And not only loneliness, but relationship struggles. Um, pe people's uh, emotional health is, is struggling because of their emotional, just the things that they're going through. Exactly. I think it caught everyone by surprise. Like, and all of a sudden we're just finding ourselves in this situation with loneliness. Now, it's interesting that medical studies show that loneliness can cause a number of health issues, including depression, anxiety, increased risks of dementia, and even 26% increased risk of death. So this isn't a trivial thing at all, is it? No, it's not. And I, I like that they, they mention it as a state of health because um, those things can deteriorate over time and we don't notice it, you know, so your emotional health and that loneliness, that, that part of it can, can just whittle away at you over time. Like we used to celebrate weddings with large groups of people and, and, and then in times of struggles like funerals, we're used to have those connections, but with a period of time that we don't normally have that in our life, then that deteriorates our, our overall emotional health. And, uh, and it, it can happen like the frog in the boiling water. It happens to a point where all of a sudden people are by themselves and not able to process some of the things they're struggling with. Absolutely. I'm sure you're seeing that a lot with your counseling, especially like you said, funerals. We can't be together to grieve our loved one. We can't be together to celebrate somebody getting married. It's just tough. Yeah. Yeah, the funerals are, I mean, the physical touch, none. There's no hugging. Um, I'm not a person that likes to hug a whole bunch, just my personality type, but, but um, at times like that, um, yeah, there, it's with, with non-existent. So you know, there's more times in our life that we ex experience, you know, these changes that, that uh, again, whittle away at our emotional health. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned physical touch because doctors, of course, say that it's so important that physical touch is crucial, right? So apparently our health even increases significantly when we get regular hugs and handshakes and maybe it needs to be done while wearing a mask. I don't know, but we do need that, don't we? Yeah, we do. And uh, I, th I think I've, I've heard it explained this way before, but because that's lacking, um, I think it was Dr. Town Townsend uh, or Dr. Cloud, one of those Christian psychologists said that, um, we, we all love steak, you know, we all love a good steak, but, you know, hamburgers are good too. So it's, it's not the, the way that we're connecting isn't the best way, but it's still got some value to it. And we have to look at the bright side on that. You know, when we can't have the physical hugs and, and those types of things, then at least to connect uh, virtually is, is, is still better than nothing. 
Yeah, so I was just going to ask you, Pastor Ralph, do you have any thoughts on how to overcome loneliness? I mean, the obvious solution is to spend more time with others, but that becomes a real challenge, obviously, during these COVID times. So people, of course, are making the use of technology, like you said. Yeah, well, I think I think the first thing to do is, is to, to give yourself an assessment and, and be honest with yourself and true to yourself if you're noticing that you're withdrawing from things or or you're finding there's conflict in your relationships which is what we see a lot of that that conflict increases and that means that you're there's there's something missing from your life and if you kind of analyze it and see where you're at um you know there's you can find some next steps to do you know it's the right thing because loneliness can cause us to maybe feel like like people don't care for us you know that they don't love us and then our response to them can sometimes be out of anger or you know frustration, and then that only increases our loneliness because who wants to be around somebody who's always angry and bitter, you know? So you, you kind of go back to what God's word says: is be forgiving and be kind and be gentle, uh, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. You know, there are just some practical things, but the first thing we want to really look at is is to be honest with ourselves, and then I, I think sometimes people get tired and want to just fix things for people when really all they are they're asking for possibly is just a bit of empathy to understand that they're struggling and it's it's in that empathetic moments that we can really connect at a deeper level with people um so i think just to be kind of in tune with what's really what's going on and look at our environment what we've been experiencing and then be more prepared that way and you know not over expecting things from other people because um, that can be a real uh, a drag on people. You know, if, you, if, if all you ever talked to was that one friend that's just always got so much going wrong, your tendency might not be so much to connect with them, which is the exact opposite of what they need. They just need someone just to hear them. You know, they may not need all the answers or, you know, the solutions. Just, just the lending in ears is really important. Yeah, for sure. Now, like we said, technology can help, but with some of the older generation, a lot of them might not be as technically savvy. So, I mean, it's still okay to use the telephone as much as possible, get connected with people. But of course, medical experts say that there are significantly greater benefits to social relationships by making time for those face-to-face -face visits. So I guess the question here is, what is the risk or benefit ratio of visiting people in person during these times? Well, I think, I think we have to analyze those individuals because I've met with uh, many of our seniors um, and we, we, when COVID first hit, we did what we called CareNet where we called every single person and we empowered a bunch of people to call people, which is, is very unusual. To get a call from a stranger nowadays is like, why are you calling me? But because of the times, we found it really necessary. And I noticed the seniors that I spoke with were so appreciative of just a call or a contact. Because I don't, I don't know, I think when we get older, and I'm getting older, I don't know that we get out as much anyways, you know, and I'm not, I'm not belittling that the importance of that initial contact. But I think our seniors are pretty resilient people. Um, but just a touch or a phone call and uh, or a driveway visit or... Uh, a visit through a door, you know, just a few moments of connectivity, I found to be so beneficial, especially with our senior crowd. Oh, exactly. I know my own mother is in that, that situation. And I feel like for the past year, it's been nothing more than just really quick, you know, hand each other something in the driveway or through my, my car door. It's, it's like, it's very challenging because you want to spend all this quality time. And of course, now it's getting warmer outside so we can arrange for more meetings outdoors. So is that a good solution as well? Meet at a, a coffee shop patio? Absolutely. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of Zoom counseling, mainly because to meet someone in person, if you're indoors, you should be wearing a mask. Yeah. Um, but another thing I've been doing is walks. And what there's multiple benefits from that. So you'll You'll see me two or three times a week walking around Henderson, just connecting with somebody around I know, the lake here in our town and uh, or the coolies. And uh, I think, again, if we look at it in a positive way, you know, I just say, hey, how would you like to go for a walk? You know, and then the individuals typically go, yeah, I, I'm up for that. You know, and then you're not you just you're, you're both. There's multiple benefits to that, but it, it feels good to be outdoors as well. 
but then to see their face not behind a mask is, is also really important. Oh, absolutely. Now, how can churches help relieve loneliness? Any thoughts on how to include people who are on their own? Well, we've, we've uh, just launched a Facebook campus. Uh, so there's much more con connectivity during the service because what we found is many people were just watching the screen as a church. And, uh, and you can watch a screen anywhere, but we were responding much more one-on-one -on -one in that aspect through our Facebook campus, which just launched. But um, we, we, invite, we still invite people out and then we watch that connectivity online and then ask them if there's anything, just ask them if there's anything we can do um, you know, for them. Do they need a hand with something? Is it, is it is a physical need or you know, maybe it's a, you know, finances or groceries or things like that. And then in that, we also have been inviting people to begin to serve because I found that many people wanted to be busy doing something rather than sitting in an empty house. So at that point, we said, well, let's empower you to do those care calls. And how would you like to connect with 10 people each week, you know, just to see how they're doing, just a 10-minute conversation or three-minute conversation. So to get people um, active, I think, is a real key thing to keep the loneliness down because, you know, we're, we're made for on purpose for a purpose. And uh, when that changes, um, we, we need to get active and just say, okay, look, we're just not going to sit locked up. There's things we can do even in that state. Um, and churches have been, I believe, instrumental in, in caring for that, that health of other individuals in our community uh, through this whole deal. That's wonderful. Now, for disabled individuals, the loneliness factor apparently doubles. And that's something to keep in mind during these times, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And, and I hats off to anybody who's caring for an individual because you know, in some cases, it's a matter of life and death. But um, I think through the studies and things like that, we still did um, our night to shine this year, but we sent out the packages to everybody. So for each of those individuals, you know, maybe within, a, you know, whatever the issues are to receive that package in the mail and then to connect with them just virtually a little bit made a difference so again receiving uh, there's other ways we can connect with people through gifts and uh, dropping a meal or you know just a card or even you know something uh, that was special to them you know that just that they feel loved and I think that's really really important for every individual yeah absolutely for our viewers that don't know what's in the what are in the packages for right to shine well in those it was a crown and I think they got some party favors like you know different different items that they could kind of have a celebration together because that was what it was night to shine was a celebration um you know like almost like a graduation for them and uh so that was what they would receive in their package and then we just encourage them just to connect with a a photo and uh, send that back you know to to our team here and then at least they, they it was a another event different but it was something that they got used to look forward to yearly and that didn't stop it just was different, that's all. Right, now what about for children? Any, any thoughts on how to get kids engaged and not to fall into that pit of loneliness or that pit of just all that screen time too? Well, you see, you see a lot of people doing uh, very unique things like drive-bys for birthday parties. I know both of my grandkids, uh, we visited them through COVID at times, uh, sometimes through a window or through uh, you know, Zoom or you know, FaceTime. But um, there's, you can get pretty creative in, in getting things, you know, active with kids. But I also know that kids are really good at connecting online. Uh, you know, they've, they've done that for years where they've got gamer friends and game tags that, that they are connected with. And that's, you know, they're sitting in their basement, you know, for hours on end. But I think the important part, what you mentioned on was how do you get them out? And uh, as parents, um, you know, like a, a scooter, a skateboard, any kind of gift that gets them outdoors is probably the best for them right at this time. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's ironic because we want to keep our kids off the screen. There's too much screen time going on. But during COVID, like you said, I mean, it's a great way for them to connect. So you almost are kind of almost thankful for all that screen time. They can connect with other communities, like you said, gamer communities and whatnot. But absolutely exercise and get outside now that it's springtime, especially, right? <laughs> Yes, exactly. And then, of course, um, 
where would we be without the word of God, right? Seeking his presence. And... That's very true. I got a first, I'm going to share a little scripture with you guys. First Peter three, it says, who's going to harm you if, if you're eager to do good, but even if you should suffer from what is right, you are blessed. Don't fear threats. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks and give a reason that the hope that you have. And that's one thing we can share during this whole season and continue to share is that we do have the hope of Christ in our lives. And, uh, and he has a purpose for us. And if you want to partner with an organization, uh, I think that's a really good way to battle loneliness is to get out and help someone else who's also in need. And, and you're likely to make a connection that way if you're empathetic to, to their situation and you're managing your own personal mental health as well, you know, but I, I think, I think this is a real time for the church to shine and, and care for our communities. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us today, Pastor Ralph. We really appreciated having you on. My pleasure. Absolutely. Ralph Molno is the site pastor at My Victory Church in Lethbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks for watching.